Good evening. Uh, welcome to another uh, Thursday online uh, Bible study. Good to have you uh, join uh, with us as we join together in the Spirit around the Word of God. So can I invite you to turn, as you know, uh, to the book of Ezra and to chapter 8. We're going to look at this uh, chapter this evening, most of it. And um, I want to, uh, we're not ignoring the first 14 verses, but I'm not actually going to, to read them. We will come back to them, but I want to read from verse uh, 15, um, uh, from verse uh, 15 through to verse uh, 32. So let's follow and let's hear the word of God being read. Ezra 8 and verse 15. I assembled them at the canal that flows towards Ahava. And we camped there three days. When I checked among the people and the priests, I found no Levites there. So I summoned Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elithan, Jarib, El Nathan, Nathan, Zechariah, Meshulam, who were leaders, and Jorarib and El Nathan who were men of learning. And I sent them to Ido, the leader in Casaphia. I told them what to say to Ido and his kinsmen, the temple servants in Casaphia, so that they might bring attendance to us for the house of our God. Because the gracious hand of our God was on us, they brought us Sherebiah, a capable man from the descendants of Mahil, son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah's sons and brothers, 18 men. And Hashabiah, together with Josiah, from the descendants of Merari, and his brothers and nephews, 20 men. They also brought 220 of the temple servants, a body that David and the officials had established to assist the Levites. All were registered by name. There by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king the gracious hand of our God is on everyone and looks to him who looks to him but his great anger is against all who forsake him so we fasted and petitioned our God about this and he answered our prayer then I set apart 12 of the leading priests together with Sherebiah, Hashabiah and ten of their brothers, and I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisers, his officials, and all Israel present there had donated for the house of our God. I weighed out to them 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold valued at one thousand darics and two fine articles of polished bronze as precious as gold. I said to them, you are, you as well as these articles are consecrated to the Lord. The silver and gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem before the leading priests and the Levites and the family heads of Israel. Then the priests and Levites received the silver and gold and sacred articles that had been weighed out to be taken to the house of our God in Jerusalem. On the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem 
where we rested three days. And we end our reading uh, there. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity again to gather together as your people in the Spirit, the same Spirit who inspired uh, these words, the same Spirit who inspired uh, Ezra. And we do just take a moment to praise you tonight, Lord. We thank you for who you are and all that you've done. We thank you for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful uh, assurance that we have that our sins have been washed and uh, forgiven by the blood of Christ, that we have been adopted into your family, that we are uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, children of the King, children of the living God, part of your church, the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, we do simply pray now uh, that you would guide us by your Spirit as we study this part of your word, that you would make it real into our hearts. Apply it, O oh God, to our hearts and into our lives and homes and families and churches. Lord, come and bless. Bless wherever your people are gathering, whether they're uh, meeting in a small group somewhere or meeting in the Spirit as we are doing. Lord, we commit it all to you and ask for your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week uh, we were encouraged as we uh, considered <clears throat> uh, God's sovereign overruling in opening up a way for uh, Ezra and others to, to travel from Babylon uh, to, to Jerusalem. And uh, we thought of that lovely phrase, God's sovereignty is our, our sanity. And maybe we've even been considering that even since last we met. And uh, we have been uh, filled with a sense of, of peace and calm and reassurance in the midst of all the ups and downs that we that we face. What we're going to do uh, this evening is... is is look at Ezra chapter 8 and, and drill further, if you like, down into what it's saying as it, it teaches us something more about that journey uh, from Babylon uh, to uh, Jerusalem. And in, in essence, Ezra chapter 8 um, basically provides some more details about those who travelled and what happened particularly at the start of uh, the journey. Uh, Ezra 8 and verses 1 to, to 14, we, we didn't uh, read it, maybe for obvious reasons. Um, there, was, there was lots of big words, um, but of course it is part of the word of God, um, so we're not ignoring it. And basically the, the first uh, 14 uh, verses provide a list of those families uh, who returned with uh, Ezra. Like if you just look at the first verse and how the, the chapter begins, Ezra 8 verse 1, these are the family heads and those registered with them who came up with me from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. Uh, so really these verses give us a list of the family uh, heads who were part of uh, the journey. Uh, notice how it begins, we're not going to get through all the verses, uh, but notice how it begins significantly. It says, of the descendants of Phinehas, Gershom, of the descendants of Itamar, uh, Daniel. So the, these two men, uh, Gershom and Daniel, were, were priests. They were from the, uh, they were from the Aaronic um, uh, priestly line. Um, going, going back uh, to, to Phineas and to Itamar, as it says here. Uh, so they are, they are mentioned, uh, first of all, uh, Gershom and, and Daniel. And then uh, from the descendants of, of David, uh, we have a, a man called Hattush. And then we have a, we have a whole a lot of other uh, names and, and families that are represented Derek Kidner in his commentary on Ezra says 
the family names in verses 4 to 14. Can all, except Joab, verse 9, be found earlier in Ezra, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 uh, to 15. And that's of uh, significance. So uh, really the people who are now travelling with Ezra, uh, um, members of their families a few generations before, had gone with the first uh, group. Now lists like these can be a bit forbidding, can't they? Uh, but there are lessons uh, to learn. And as I'm saying, uh, just, just think about it this way. S some of the relatives of, of these families, 80 years or thereabouts before all of this, uh, had, had taken uh, the journey. Let me put this, that in a slightly different way, but essentially saying the same thing. 80 years before all of this happened, 80 years before this happened, uh, there had been uh, people who had gone, some had gone, some had not gone, but a fresh a challenge has been raised by Ezra. A fresh call, if you like, has been extended. Uh, we, we need people to, to go uh, and to return to Jerusalem. And there are those, albeit fewer than in the first wave um, of, of travellers, uh, there are those, albeit fewer, um, who are ready uh, to go. Now, let's think about this for a moment. When you, when you think about this, those who, who stepped up, uh, those who heard about this challenge, this call, those who stepped up were, were, were obviously open and sympathetic to the, the vision uh, that Ezra had presented. Many of them, many of them hadn't even been born uh, when the previous wave of exiles had returned. But here's the point, they had heard, they had been taught, and now they were responding. I think it is a, a good example um, to, to keep on teaching and training a new uh, generation. So 80 years previous, uh, people had gone, but those who had remained, uh, they hadn't just abandoned the faith. They weren't uninterested. They had passed on the message. And, and here's the fruit of this. Ephesians chapter 6. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Some will have heard me uh, say before, we live in uncertain days and... Um, Cynical days, but it's always a great tragedy, isn't it, in an uncertain age uh, to see uh, people who, we might say, Presbyterian people, uh, Presbyterian fathers and parents being slack and careless in the spiritual nurture of uh, their, their children. And as I say that, I'm not, I'm not saying it in a, in a judgmental way or in a harsh way, I trust. But just, just as, a, as a fact, that's the way it is, sadly. And I'm going to particularly just mention uh, fathers for a moment. Fathers not taking their responsibility seriously. Or maybe just leaving it to the mum. Not realising that such fathers are teaching their children, not least their sons, that if the things of God are not really that important uh, to dad, well then, they're not really that important for me either. And that is, a, that is an awful, awful tragedy. So I don't know, maybe um, a parent will hear this, maybe a father will hear, hear this and, 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 and just be struck. And, and I trust brought to the place where you realise, look actually, that needs to change. You're setting the, 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 a very unhelpful example and you can do much, much better. More positively, let me put it like this. What a mighty impact for God and for good is made when parents take seriously their God-given responsibility to nurture their uh, children. 
and to do so by, by word and life, word and example. Parents, fathers, nurture your children spiritually. Because if you do not, someone else will. Don't be left a few years down the line saying with much regret, if only. So we see here that this is much more than a list of names. When we dig a wee bit behind the names, we realise that here are people uh, who had been taught, who had taken on board the faith of their fathers and are now ready to stand up and step forward and may we do likewise. So that's the first thing, these first verses, 1 to 14, much more than just a list of names that can be hard to pronounce. The second thing that I want to just draw out from this passage tonight is really to do with um, the fact that we're told here in the story um, of something that they discovered as they're all sort of gathering and congregating to set out on this uh, massive journey. So uh, look at verse uh, uh, 15 and, and see, see what it says. It says, I assembled them at the canal that flows towards Ahava, and we camped there three days. When I checked among the people and the priests, I found no Levites there. I found no Levites. The Levites who were there, well, they were the descendants of Levi, uh, who were set apart to help serve in uh, the temple. One commentator says this, he says it's likely that the Levites had not responded to the call because of the chance to own property and settle in Babylon had proved much more attractive than the strict routines of temple service. Uh, so basically with the situation here uh, where the people are gathering up and taking stock and Ezra notices that they don't have any Levites. And verses 16 through to 20 tell us what was then done. Basically, if you look at those verses, it tells us that Ezra called together uh, the leaders and their names are given there in, in verse uh, 16. Uh, you can read them for yourselves. And he, he wisely, he then dispatches these leaders to a location called uh, Casaphia. Uh, the, if you're reading an AV or an ESV, it says the place Casaphia. Now, nothing really more is, is known about this place, uh, but we, we, we do know from, from this text and from this passage that it's obvious that people were trained um, as Levites in that place and people who had been trained as Levites uh, could be found in that place. Uh, look at verse, um, verse 18. Because the gracious hand of our God was on us, they brought us Sherebiah, a capable man from the descendants of Mali, son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah's sons and brothers, uh, 18 men, and uh, Hashabiah. So basically what, what we're told is, if you do your, your counting, it seems that there were 38 Levites who were brought along with over 200 temple uh, servants. So this, this venture um, was, was blessed and, and successful um, in many, many ways. And, and we're taught here about Ezra, uh, this man of God, and, and, and we're told a little bit here about his his wisdom when he was faced with a shortage of, of people, a shortage of helpers, a shortage of workers. And in many ways, we, um, we're also in those situations, aren't we? A 
And just as, as Ezra showed God-given wisdom and, and, and trying to deal with a shortage of people, may we prayerfully seek and know real wisdom as we are often faced with a shortage of, of people and helpers in working for the kingdom. May we seek and know God's wisdom to know what we should do by the grace of God in seeking to see others raised up for the work. And that's something that, that maybe we can, we can pray about later on, that God would help us in this. So what we're seeing so far in, in, in Ezra chapter 8, uh, the first 14 verses, the list of names, but the, uh, the challenging lesson uh, behind that, of training and nurturing uh, young people in the faith. And then we see this little section, 15 to 20, about the lack of, of Levites and uh, how that was, was dealt with. The third thing that this passage speaks to us about, I think, of significance, is the calling of a fast and waiting upon God and basically this is recounted for us uh, in, in verses uh, 21 uh, through to uh, 23 if you look at uh, your Bible uh, there look at verse uh, 21 there by the Ahava canal I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey, a straight way is the idea behind that, a safe journey for us and our children and all our possessions. It's interesting, the authorised version says that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for our substance. Believers are, are realists, at least I think we ought to be. And this was a really significant venture, not without risk, a very real potential for danger. No wonder they were concerned as they pondered setting out on this long journey, they were concerned for themselves, they were concerned uh, for their little ones, their children, who wouldn't be. They were concerned for their substance. And verse uh, 22 uh, tells us that, that Ezra decided not to take protection uh, from the king. Why was that? Well, because basically he had made it clear to the king that God would be with them. You see that there in verse 22. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us because we had told the king the gracious hand of our God is on everyone. We applaud Ezra's faith and honesty, don't we? And you know, there are many times when, when I would be saying to people and indeed to myself, take whatever help comes your way. So how does that all tie in with what we see um, Ezra uh, doing here? On this occasion, Ezra took this decision that he, he would politely decline the offer of military assistance and safe conduct. Now, I think we should be careful about making uh, this kind of text into an absolute uh, principle, especially when we bear in mind that a, a few chapters later in the story of scripture that we read about Nehemiah, who some years later when he was taking a similar journey, we're told about it in Nehemiah chapter two, that he actually takes up the offer of military escort. 
So let's think about this. And I don't think we should be rushing in and uh, sort of applauding the spiritual Ezra and the less spiritual or the practical uh, Nehemiah. I don't think that's the way we ought to read it. We ought not to be quick in making some judgment on these men and on Ezra. It reminds uh, me of it reminds me of of, of Romans uh, chapter fourteen, and you may want to glance over to Romans chapter fourteen, uh, verses five and, and six. Let me read them to you. It says this: One man considers one day more sacred than another; another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced or persuaded in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to the Lord. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to the Lord. Let each man be persuaded in his own heart. Let each man and woman be convinced in their own mind and heart of these things. Ezra did what he believed was correct in this situation. And Nehemiah, some years later, did what he believed was correct in that situation. Let each of us be persuaded in our own minds about various um, things that we that we face in the Christian life and in the Christian uh, journey and, and just because a, a brother or a sister uh, does something slightly different in their situation let's not be too quick to judge them or criticize them let's pray for them and pray one for the other. And, th and then we have this fast. Verse uh, 23. So we fasted. And petitioned our God about this. And he answered our prayer. So we fasted. And petitioned our God. The ESV says. So we fasted and implored our God. Fasting. In the scriptures it would seem that fasting is expected. And maybe this is part of our spiritual problem that somehow or other we have either completely neglected it or forgotten about it or just can quietly set it to the side. You remember Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you fast and when you fast. What are the reasons for people uh, fasting? According to the scriptures, well, we could spend a, a long time on this, and, and I'm not going to spend a very long time on it. But let me let me just mention some of them. To humble oneself before God. For example, Psalm thirty-five, verse thirteen: I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. Or to express concern for the work of God. Nehemiah, who would follow some years later, when he heard about Jerusalem, he sat down and, and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Or fasting to express repentance and a returning unto God. Joel 2 verse 12 is a good example of this. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. And maybe across our whole land and nation, we desperately need that. Or to seek guidance. Some of you will know the name of David Brainard, uh, a, a young man who had a real heart for... Um, few hundred years ago 
in North America, the native Indian people. One day he wrote in his diary, I set apart this day for fasting and prayer to God, for his grace, especially to prepare me for the work of the ministry, to give me divine aid and direction. To strengthen prayer. John Calvin said this, whenever men are to pray to God concerning any great matter, it would be expedient to appoint fasting along with prayer. And to seek deliverance or protection. And I think when we come to this passage here in Ezra, really those last couple, to seek deliverance and protection and to strengthen us in our praying, I think that's the focus of the fasting here in Ezra uh, chapter uh, 8. A kind of, a, as somebody put it, a clearing of the decks for, for, for action. Folks, I wonder how much we know of these things. And we say, Lord, lead us. Lead us to experience more of what it is to fast and to pray, and to seek God. The last um, main thing that I want to draw your attention to in this passage is really picking up on what verses uh, 24 to, to 30 uh, tell us. Because basically they, they tell us of how, uh, bearing in mind that they were going to be carrying many precious articles and much silver and gold. And basically they tell us of how Ezra entrusted to each of the 12 leading priests and 12 of the Levites, he entrusts to each of these men a significant amount of the gold and the silver and the other treasure that they were uh, carrying. And you can Read about it there, verses 24 and following. Verse 28 is significant. Verse 28, I said to them, you as well as these articles are consecrated to the Lord. Each man was responsible for what had been given uh, to him. Each of them was responsible for what had been given to them until the day when they would arrive in Jerusalem and it would all be measured back into the hand of those in Jerusalem. No pressure. But they were consecrated to the Lord. And you know, today, folks, each believer is responsible for what has been given uh, to them. We could be more precise, a couple of examples. Christian father, think about your family that way. Christian parent, think about your children that way. Christian elder, think about your district and your responsibilities that way. Youth worker, Sunday school teacher, brigade leader. Think about your young people and your responsibilities in that way. And even though over this past year our responsibilities and the, the actual outworking of that has been quite different, uh, we still should, and it's good to be reminded at this stage as we turn a, a big corner in the whole uh, pandemic, Let's see all of this as being something that's consecrated to the Lord and given over uh, to the Lord. Musician, singer, leading worship in some capacity. Think of your leading in this way. And so we could go on and on with example after example. Consecrated to uh, the Lord. Because just in the same way as these men, with the heavy responsibility of, of, of all of that that they were carrying, and that really focused their, their thoughts and their lives and their hearts, in the same way, 
if we realize that what we have been called to and just within the church, outside the church, our everyday lives, that it's consecrated to the Lord, that it's to be done as consecrated to the Lord, that will have an effect on how we do it. It will encourage us and inspire us and motivate us. It will deliver us from a kind of a shoddy, half-heartedness, oh, I'll do rightly sort of attitude, which is not good enough, actually. And so uh, we, we read... Uh, wonderfully in verse 31 that on the twelfth day of the first month we set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us and he protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. Verse 32 so we arrived in Jerusalem, where we rested three days. I'm sure they did. It's interesting, there's no detail at all about anything that happened during that arduous trip, apart from the one detail that's most important. God was with us. He protected us. And we say to God be the glory for that. Because that's the most important thing, isn't it? And even in our own uh, journeys at times, there'll be many a, a detail um, not really commented on. But at the end of the day, God's hand upon us. And we arrive safely. To God be the glory. So as we conclude uh, this uh, study uh, tonight and, and turn to prayer, let me mention a few things, um, some prayer points that will pick up on the points that we have been learning from, from this passage in Ezra. Let's pray for God's help in teaching and training a new generation. Let's pray for parents and as parents. Let's pray for God's help in, in seeking new workers being raised up in wisdom and seeing how that can be done. Let's pray for wisdom along uh, the journey. Let's pray for wisdom in seeking God and knowing those times when we do really implore God and when we fast and pray. And let's pray for a sense that in all that we do and all that we are, it is consecrated to the Lord. So let me lead you in a, in a short prayer and then, as we've said before, you can continue in the spirit uh, to seek the Lord and wait upon the Lord as he leads you. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We do indeed pray, O oh God, seeing this example uh, tonight. We pray, O oh God, for help in teaching and training a new generation. We pray, Lord, for Christian parents, for Christian mums and dads, and not least Christian fathers, to take their responsibility very seriously and we pray for the nurturing and raising up of children who at every stage give all that they understand of themselves to all that they understand of Jesus. Lord, help us. Lord, we pray that you would help us in seeing new believers being raised up and workers being raised up. Give us wisdom, O God. As a bit like Ezra, he discovered there were no Levites and did what he did. Lord, at times we see gaps in the church and gaps in Christian service. Help us to see ways of seeing those uh, gaps filled. And Lord, even in our own 
uh, churches. We can maybe think of specific situations where there are vacancies and, and gaps in organisations. Lord, raise up those who will fill these. Father, we pray for wisdom along uh, the way and wisdom in the journey. Help us all to be persuaded in our own hearts as to what is the right thing to do. Lord, give us wisdom in seeking you and imploring you and even with times of waiting upon you, particularly in fasting and in prayer, guide and lead us and instruct us in your way. And help us, Lord, as we consecrate all things. Teach us again, O God, in our own lives and homes and in our church families that all is to be done unto the Lord. Deliver us, O God, uh, from uh, a Sunday-only Christianity. And help us, Lord, each day of each week to live as unto the Lord. Father, we do continue to remember um, all those who are on our hearts. Those, O oh God, who are in hospital, awaiting going into hospital, maybe awaiting treatment or receiving treatment or just struggling um, in body, mind or spirit. We continue to, to pray for William and his situation, O oh God, for your overruling there. We continue to pray, O oh God, for, for Bethany and her family, asking for your hand to be very much upon her. And Lord, for others who may not be mentioned by name at this, this point, but Lord, uh, we will mention them in a moment in our own prayers. Lord, for the wider work of the gospel across our land and these islands and the world. Lord, for our suffering brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, for the preaching and proclamation of the gospel, even this coming Sunday in our local church families and congregations. So Lord, we're looking to you. Thank you for the privilege of just looking at your word and just waiting upon you in prayer. We just ask, O oh God, that you would lead us out in prayer now and encourage us and bless us together because we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen.